to exonerate the innocent using DNA and other evidence, and we also work to prevent wrongful convictions. Uh, we're based in Missoula at the UM Law School, where we run the, the Innocence Clinic, which brings together students from four disciplines, law and journalism, and also paralegal studies and criminology students who all come on board for a year to learn about the justice system and to help us work on our cases. Um, with a small staff, we need all the help we can get, and, and we're also really proud to be training the next generation of Montana's lawyers and journalists um, through our program. Um, Montana was one of the last states to create an Innocence Project, so we got it up and running in, in 2008, and we've been hard at work ever since then. Um, to date, we've reviewed over 400 cases from all over the state, and we now have four in litigation. Um, we work tirelessly on these cases to ensure that we're working to help people who are actually innocent, people who, have, uh, who are sitting behind bars who, by definition, should not be there. And so we spend a lot of time working on these cases and, and take the, the responsibility very seriously in terms of working to, to find evidence to help those who are innocent. Um, just briefly, I want to, we have a small staff I mentioned and we need all the help we can get from students. We have two full-time and two part-time people. Brendan McQuillan is our staff attorney and here he is. Um, ben Darrow is our development manager over here and these are both great people to talk to if you have more questions about our casework or want to learn more about our work around the state. I also want to introduce Dan Weinberg who's our founder and board president standing here in the red shirt. And so thank you to Ben and Brendan and Dan and the other people um, on the board of the Innocence Project. We really rely heavily on, on the small staff and on our great board of directors. Um, and also on a network of volunteers we work with around the state. Um, I want to single out Wendy Holden, who's a local attorney here who's done amazing work with us. Um, we rely upon uh, cooperating council to, to help us move cases forward. <laughs> Uh, so that's just a little bit about our organization, about innocence work around the country. To date, 305 people have been cleared by DNA evidence around the, around the country, and that number raises, uh, increases day by day, week by week. Um, when we started the Innocence Project, there had only been 218 people cleared, um, and now around the country we're at 305. Another um, more than 700 people have been cleared by other types of evidence, people like Barry, who maybe um, DNA evidence has been lost or destroyed, but there's other compelling evidence that, that leads judges to, um, to free innocent people. Um, this work and, and the innocent people freed around the country really demonstrate the need for this work in Montana and, um, and elsewhere. Um, there's, it, it, you know, once you're convicted, it's a major uphill battle to, to help any individual person um, to try to clear their name and regain their freedom. We also believe that it's really important at the Innocence Project not just to help individual people, but to learn from these mistakes that have been demonstrated by DNA and to improve our justice system so that um, all the resources and time and human lives aren't uh, being wasted through these mistakes. So toward that end, we've worked uh, on, on the policy side to, to improve the justice system in Montana by helping pass a law requiring that all felony interrogations be recorded, a really simple but important step that, uh, that helps ensure justice. We've also been working to improve preservation of DNA evidence throughout the state uh, because in Montana preservation is only required for three years past conviction and we really need to maintain this evidence so it, it's available as a tool for our justice system. Uh, we've also been working uh, to address the leading cause of wrongful convictions, eyewitness identification issues, uh, which play a role in over 75% of uh, cases later overturned by DNA. And we've been working with the Montana Law Enforcement Academy to improve training about eyewitness identification procedures and um, working cooperatively with law enforcement throughout the state. Um, this is really long running and difficult work to do in terms of being an uphill battle. Um, and that takes a lot of support. We're really fortunate to have received uh, two grants from the U.S. Department of Justice that help underwrite um, a lot of our work. 
but we rely on um, other foundations throughout the state, the Angora Ridge Foundation, Isla B. Dowsman Fund, the Montana Justice Foundation, OU Plata Foundation, and we, we really couldn't do what we do without their support. Um, we also couldn't do this work without the support of individuals like you here today. We um, are working hard to build a team of people throughout the state who believe in this work and who uh, put their dollars behind this belief so that we can continue um, the, the great work that we have had underway the last few years. So that's just a, an overview about our work here at the Montana Innocence Project. Um, I'd love to tell you, uh, any of you, more about our work and would love to visit with some of you. But I don't want to take up all your time here tonight. I know many of you are here to listen to Barry Beach talk. Um, I, uh, I first met Barry Beach when I was a reporter for the Missoula Independent. Uh, and. Um, and in, investigated Barry's case and wrote extensively about his case. And so I came to know Barry when he was behind bars more than six years ago. Um, if you had asked me six years ago if I would be standing here and about to introduce Barry Beach at a fundraiser for the Montana Innocence Project, um, I never would have made that bet. Um, but here we are. Barry Beach is a remarkable individual, and it's an honor to have him here with us today. So thank you. I, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I just want to start off by saying it is such an honor for me to be here with you tonight. I can't even begin to tell you the people in this room and what they mean to me. Wendy Holton fought for me for 12 years pro bono as a lawyer. Uh, I was actually sitting on the inside. I had lost my previous lawyer. I was without a lawyer. When a lady from the, well, it was Amy Guth, wasn't it? That was a fellow student at the University of M, told her that she should look into this case. She spent 12 years fighting for me pro bono. Ron Waterman's here somewhere. Ron Waterman helped me on when I was on the inside. We fought together for over 10 years on some legal issues when I fought against the Department of Corrections concerning what I consider to be inhumane issues and treatment of inmates on the inside. Ron Waterman stepped up and helped me, pro bono, from, the, from his heart. He stepped up and helped me. Scott Crichton is here. I can remember all the way back in the early 80s, Scott Crichton and I, here he is. Scott and I worked on, uh, at that time, they were shutting down Warm Springs and there was no place for the mentally de developed or handicapped to be placed, so they were placing them on the prison yard. And Scott Crichton stepped up pro bono and helped me fight the Department of Corrections. There's many members here of the Montanans for Justice organization, which I can't even begin to say enough about, who stood behind me and helped my case become a public image while I was still on the inside, who all I met through prison ministries and Christian organizations uh, on the inside. So I am more than overwhelmed and honored to stand here tonight and talk uh, to this group of people. Jesse talked about the beginning of the Montana Innocence Project. As an innocent man sitting on the inside, you just want anybody to listen to you. And you don't care who you talk to. I've, I, this is no joke. I have stood in maximum security lockdown cells and talked to the walls about being innocent of the crime that put me in prison. Because I wanted somebody to listen. And I knew it was just a cement wall. And in a, lot of, in a couple of them that I was in, I could actually touch this cement wall and this cement wall. And so I would talk to both of them. <laughs> you want somebody to hear you. I spent over 18 years fighting for my help. And I had tremendous lawyers along the way like Wendy Holt to help me. And she's one of the few that truly believes some of the craziness that went on in my case when I would talk to her about. No, Wendy, you don't understand. This girl, dad, is a police officer. You need to understand who these people are. Yeah, okay, Barry, but the law says, you know, no, no, wait, you need to understand this. <clears throat> because you're so desperate. And you get 
so desperate that the thoughts of suicide are more prevalent in your fight against the system. I was telling a few ladies earlier, we got to talking about the death penalty. And I have a totally different take on the death penalty. I am opposed to the death penalty in the state of Montana, and I was recently down here to lobby against the death penalty in the state of Montana. But yet at the same time, on the inside of my heart, doing a life without parole, I can't even tell you how many days I asked the Almighty God in heaven to take my life because I couldn't wake up another day. I didn't want to get up in that cement cell again. I didn't want to go to sleep on that cement bunk again. And I couldn't see the daylight. I couldn't, you know, and God, God would assure me, someday I'm going to set you free, you know. Man, there was times I wished I had that death penalty because the lethal injection wouldn't, you know. And yet, look at now. Look at me now. It's the reason that we should oppose the death penalty, because look at me now. You know, I have a full-time job. I have great friends. You know, I've been to places in the last year that I couldn't even have dreamed of. I've spoke at six different colleges. I've been to four high schools. I've been to 15 churches. I've spoke before the Billings Public Defender's Office, the Montana Wyoming Tribal Leaders Council. I've been to two different tribal council chambers and spoke about Native American issues. I've been to Princeton, New Jersey and spoke about the innocence. <clears throat> and yet there were days in the inside that I just wanted to die because I couldn't get nobody to listen to me. And to fight to try and prove your innocence once you've been convicted is an astronomical attempt because nobody does want to hear you. And the system's view on it is that we've already convicted you. Why should we listen to you now? You've been convicted. Are you saying that I'm a liar? Because that's the court's position. Are you saying that I'm a liar? I am the tribunal of the United States of America. You're saying that I'm a liar? And you're a pitiful inmate that's incarcerated in chains and concrete saying, yeah, you're a liar. I hate to tell you this, but yeah, you are. And so you get... Lock him up. He don't like where he's at now? Chip him someplace else. And then you get to start over. I'd like to back up a little bit to the Montana Innocence Project. Because I don't want to miss this opportunity. In 2006, November 16th of 2006, I was doing an interview with a young lady at that time by the name of Jesse McQuillan who was writing for a newspaper called the Missoula Independent. During that six and a half hour interview, she asked me a question. She says, if you could do anything with your life, what would you do? And I told her, I want to create an innocence project in Montana. Because I don't think that anybody should ever have to go through what I did for 18 years to try and find an organization that has the financial support and the investigators and the lawyers to fight for them. And it was just a statement in passing, so to speak, until about a year and a half later, we were sitting in a clemency hearing before the Montana Parole Board where many, many of these people you see in front of you were present, including Dan Weinberg, who for some reason as a criminal psychologist had an interest in wrongful convictions and had actually been out to Princeton, New Jersey prior to that to Centurion Ministries, which is the organization that finally took my cause. Dan Weinberg, through the hand of God, ended up sitting next to Jesse McQuillan at this clemency hearing. And somehow they got to talk. And I think you were introduced by Jim, weren't you, Dan? No. To, no. Go on. <laughs> but, I, I don't want to wreck your story. <laughs> no. but, but somehow the two of them met or were introduced to each other through the clemency hearing. Two years later, I believe it was, they founded the Montana Innocence Project. As much as I'm honored to stand here today, I was even more honored, and, and people don't believe this, but the greatest miracle that God performed in my life was when the parole board denied me. Because when the parole board denied me, it sent anger 
throughout the United States of America and around the world. But more importantly, it left me on the inside, and I actually got to spend a couple of years on the inside putting up flyers for the Montana Innocence Project, talking to inmates on behalf of the Montana Innocence Project, and trying to help other people who were claiming to be innocent. Do I say they're innocent? Let's prove it. I, I just want to have the opportunity. I don't care if they're innocent or not. They have the opportunity through the Innocence Project to present their case. And that's why this is so important tonight. Being here tonight and supporting this organization, you're giving an opportunity to the next person behind me to have the chance to say I'm innocent. To have somebody who's willing to listen to their voice. And we don't have to go to New Jersey to find that person, to find that organization. We're better society than that in the state of Montana. And we're much, much better society because we now have our own Innocence Project. We're better human beings than to ignore an innocent person sitting in prison. And because of the Innocence Project, we're much better human beings in the state of Montana. There might be somebody, and don't get me wrong, because I know every person sitting on death row. I know them personally, I knew a couple of them before they ended up there. I've sat in cells next to them, I've walked yards with them, I've sat in max with them. But there may be somebody on death row who's innocent. And it's going to be these people who defend their life. It's going to be you people who allow them to defend that person. One of the things that's interesting about Centurion Ministries who took my case is they only represent people who are doing life without parole or are sitting on death row. They have a tremendous, tremendous track record for exonerating people from death row, including the first female who was ever exonerated off death row in Texas, a lady by the name of Joyce Brown. And that's the name of her book. It's the, the story of Joyce Brown by Joyce Brown. We now have Jesse McQuillan, Brendan McQuillan, Dan Weinberg, Ben, I met Ben somewhere earlier tonight, and all you other people who are standing behind them. I cannot begin to tell you all those days that I asked God to take my life, I apologize to you for that. Because I didn't know you we existed out here. I didn't know you cared. All I felt was the suffering of them four walls and knowing that my mom was getting older and knowing that my nieces and nephews were being born and I wasn't there and they were graduating high school and I couldn't go and my grandmas and my grandpas were dying. I lost 15 family members while I was incarcerated and didn't get to go to a single funeral. Not one. What you're doing here tonight is about human life. It's not about money. It's not about joining together to, for a single cause. It's about human life. My mom sends her regards. She wanted to be here, but she has two grandkids that she's raising, and she couldn't find a babysitter. <laughs> so she sent Ziggy. <laughs> My surrogate. <laughs> That's your cause. Um, yeah. My mom wanted to give all of you a hug, and she sends her love. We've had some amazing family experiences, including the Easter that we just shared together. I can't tell you what it was like that my first Christmas out of prison, for the first time in over 35 years, we had our entire family together in one house at one time. First time in 35 years for my mom to have all of her kids together. Uh, we've shared a lot of moments since. So when I talk about the Innocence Project being about human life, think about your kids. And think about your kids in two senses. First of all, what would you do if you didn't have your kid for Christmas? And second of all, Think about how easy it is to lose your kid to the judicial system if there isn't an organization like Montana Innocence Project.
because it happens that fast. I was teasing a guy two days ago. I had had a police report in my hands. And I happened to be talking to a friend of mine, and their nephew was standing next to him. And I'm showing a friend of mine, and I'm telling him how easy it is to end up in prison. We're standing there with a legitimate police report. And this is just a friend of mine. Her nephew standing there and says, hey, look, you've got blue eyes. It says he has blue eyes. I said, in fact, you're about five foot nine, aren't you? He says, yeah, I'm five ten. I says, look, he's five between five nine and five ten.